Okay, everyone, I am really, really glad to have you guys here and um, hopefully we'll have more people join us as, as the uh, meeting goes on. But I just want to say thank you for dropping in to join us. Um, today we are celebrating the book launch of Christina's book, The Gravity of Existence. Um, this beautiful, beautiful cover art by Anna Sergan, who is a Ukrainian artist, um, and I, we just happened to find um, her online, and it was just—I was just so stoked to have a Ukrainian artist and support her. Christina, you have had so many cool books come out, and you are such a prolific poet. <laughs> um, it is—it is so inspiring to me to to see you like publish and all the all the things that you do. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Christina is the three-time Bram Stoker award-winning author, three times, which is amazing. And your work is always being nominated for awards. Um, the other books that you've done are a collection of nightmares and a collection of dreamscapes and tortured willows. And then also the Elgin um, Award runner-up Astro Poetry um, nominee, an assortment of Sky Things, and the Haiku Chapbooks, A Constellation of Songs, and Cat Coo. We're both cat lovers, so <laughs> that's so lovely. Um, and you're, you also publish essays for Interstellar Flight Magazine, um, which I'm always very excited whenever we get your essays, um, including Final Girl, which was um, the Bram Stoker nominated essay in the short nonfiction category. Um, so that was really lovely. It's, it's always um, fun to do those horror specials in October. And I'm always like, Christina, send me something. <laughs> You know, I, when I got this um, submission, I knew it was going to be at the top of our pile. <laughs> um, and, you know, our guest editor and I talked about it and um, Saba and Saba, you know, was like, this is the, the, on the surface, the poems seem sort of simple, but they are very deep and really have a lot of substance despite being, you know, kind of small poems, which I really want to talk more with you about that, Christina, because I'm teaching a, um, a small poetry workshop in 2023. And so I'm like, I'm going to be putting Christina's poems in my workshop. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, I mean, we're, we'll have more time to talk at the end of the reading. Um, but I just want to say thank you, everybody, for being here and for listening to Christina read and for supporting Interstellar Flight Press. Um, you know, we have many cool new poetry books planned for next year. Um, and uh, like our next one is Inish, Inish Rook Bash, um, their book of goth chronic illness poems that are also kind of smaller poems. So, you know, that should be a really good one. And I'm just delighted, you know, to get to have you, Christina. So um, I am going to turn off my video and hand the mic over to you so that you can give us a lovely reading of your work. Um, very excited. Here we go. Thank you. And thank, thank you so much, Holly. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, let me just try and figure out Zoom. Oh, God, I'm looking at myself now. <laughs> OK, thank you for getting this uh, live stream. That's very exciting. Um, and uh, thank you to Holly, who's doing the technical genius behind this. Um, I'm very grateful that um, she and Saba chose to publish my book, um, The Gravity of Existence, which is a um, collection of small, small poems. And um, I am very thrilled to read some of my favorites to you today. Um, I thought I'd start with the first, um, with the first, well, I would call it a haibun, um, it, which is a bit of a prose, which has prose and poetry in it. Um, it's basically a short piece of prose with um, haiku. So um, I thought it'd be apt to start the collection with, um, with a poem to do with gravity and with, um, with human life of how, how we love and we lose people we love. The gravity of loss. It was sheer luck that you took flight 250 and I, Flight 851. How grateful I am that we made up before we parted. As I now sob 
uncontrollably, watching your plane engines sputter and fail, be falling. The age old battle between force and gravity, the gravity of loss. Um, all right. And one of the poems that I, I really love, um, actually, this is a collection of poems I really love, um, all my favorite small poems, um, is Sand Under a Microscope. Um, I think it would veer a little towards contemporary poems, but um, uh, towards a contemporary poem. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's a bit of um, speculative element in it. Sand under a microscope. The loveliest of all collections lies under a microscope. In a handful of sand, a treasure trove. Tiny amoebic shells frozen in time. Petrified wood, frightened of life. Rare as your quartz, lost in the sea. A crystal wishbone. Perfect and unbroken, the treasure of this collection. Uh, the next section is about real monsters. Um, and um, I mean, for me, I think real monsters, having spent most of my misspent youth <laughs> in cemeteries and haunted houses looking for traces of, of ghosts, uh, didn't find any, but uh, got a lot of dust on me. Um, so for me, I think real monsters are, are people really, you know, bad people. So um, here is a sparrow. I turn into a sparrow when the sky turns gray. I cover the ground with a blanket of red. Vengeance is sweet and slowly pet. I savor the taste. It's been a long wait. And going a little darker. The monsters at home. Um, the way the uh, poems are structured are um, each single, as, as you know, haiku don't really have titles. Um, so the section header basically um, categorizes the, the haiku in it. So each, each little poem you read there is one individual poem. So uh, I'm going to read the section Monsters at Home, which has three little poems. Childhood monster standing before me, ordering coffee. Black moon. Another mysterious booze. And something a little lighter. A hundred soul draining years of living with wraith, the price of dark magic. Okay. Um, our humor's always fun to put into horror, isn't it? <laughs> um, I actually kind of like this section as well. It's called Monstrous. Um, you know, sometimes uh, monsters turn us to, you know, turn us to uh, monstrous acts as well. So, um, so this is Monstrous. Uh, turning my skin inside out. Laundry day. Dust carpet. My monster imprint under the bed. Keepsakes I treasure, pinned on the wall, your flayed skin. Snow plains, so hard to hide, a blood trail. Unrelentlessly, the blood rain falls, routine decapitation. Okay, moving along. Um, okay, this is one super fun one. Um, 
I, I grew up in a time where vampires were rife and basically all the way through, it was a great love of vampires. And ironically, I, I actually loved um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer the most. And I watched it many times throughout my life. And um, I think that's another essay, Holly. <laughs> the joy of traveling. Go see the world, they said. It'll be fun, they said. <sighs> Stranded on a ship with nothing left to eat. No one to navigate. Lost seasick vampire. Okay, we have body parts, which may not be suitable for a G audience. Um, and here we go to my favorite childhood tales. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, and you can see the cats uh, as bookmarked there, which, which always cheer me. Okay, this is one of my favorite uh, joint haiku. Uh, in fact, I think it's my only joint haiku. I, I really should write more. But um, uh, if you followed my work, you know that I love uh, Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is, this is her story in haiku, a joint form. Little Red in haiku. Flash of red through the woods, Alarabs. Old goat, tougher than expected, long lunch. Sweetness of maraschino cherries, baby smells. Role playing another species, something new. Calmness tenderizes the meat, grandma, not grandma. Clear anomalies, the sharpness of teeth and claws. The speed of younglings, chest arrow. Her sobs as he fades to black. Grandma bones uncovered. Okay, I have quite a few um, fairy tale poems, which are always fun. Um, yeah, I will, I will read uh, a few of them. Um, Snow white, red apples on a windowsill, stepdaughter arriving. <laughs> Sleeping beauty, bloody spindle, putting another princess under again. Rapunzel, repelling for the first time. Cinderella, midnight, one slipper missing again. Thrown away in recycling, glass slippers stained with blood from the stepsister's severed toes. Even as queen, still a sneaker kind of girl, Cinderella. Okay. We have um, some of the more contemporary work like Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland, two, two of my really, my favorite stories. And I think so much mythology has come out from them. Um, I just had to have a little spin as well. Um, the Wizard of Oz, tornado warning, putting on my red shoes, just in case. Dorothy, yellow bricks on this road, she takes the Ruby Express instead. Alice in Wonderland. Autumn moon. A cat fades in, a cat fades out. Now let's move on to ghost stories. I know I, 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 I'm, you know, I grew up in a time where, where ghost stories were pretty rife. Um, and... Uh, you know, I was pretty scared when I was growing up because my, my parents kept telling me that my, um, my house was haunted because um, the opposite was a Japanese POW camp during World War II. Um, so, you know, there were prisoners tortured and everything. And, and an aunt who came by to, to live, she, came, she, she stayed only once um, because she claimed that she heard chains being dragged and stuff. Um, but 
I, I never saw anything and I was the kid who was, you know, constantly playing in the shadows. So, um, but they still, um, they still intrigue and mystify me. And, you know, part of me does really hope that, um, you know, that, that there is some kind of other dimension out there. So let's let's talk about ghosts here. Um, yes, Lee, um, just answering Lee's question here. Um, yes, I, I do kind of link um, my poems to be read as a sequence, uh, if need be. Um, just, just like I kind of organize my poems to have an overarching story. Because, um, you know, I, I kind of like I kind of like playing with layers and stuff like that. So yes, it was it was intentional actually. Okay, let's move on to ghosts. Old photo. All those years, we thought the ghost was just a smudge. Midnight. Philosophical conversations with my dead grandmother. Bringing my kitty back from the grave, I promised her I'd never leave her. Longing to be extinguished every single day. Thousand year old ghosts still trapped at home. Uh, and if you need to expand the anguish, just watch Beetlejuice. I think, you know, I think we all feel that pain <laughs> being stuck at home. Um, Yes. All right, let's talk a bit about magic, which is always a lovely topic. Solar eclipse, the dead rise from the shadows. Um, if you like uh, zombie movies, oh, sorry, vampire movies, this is, this is when that moment happens. Um, whispered words from genetic memory. My dead cat alive again, the forgotten art of necromancy. Spell book spent, finally accepting that dead is dead. Animate dead things. Zombie apocalypse. Sorry, world. Okay, moving on to science. Science has given us a lot of. Um, fantastic things, but also some pretty scary things. Electroconvulsive therapy, session one. Remember it now in all its terrible glory, sent current through brain, awful memory erased. Ready? Remember the next. Okay, here's a fun cat one, um, because cats are all in this book, uh, all over this book. Um, a new earth, new salat, the inception of spontaneous wormholes on earth turns science experiments awry. <sighs> Yet again, Schrodinger's cat vanishes from the glass box only to reappear beside its food bowl. Okay, moving on to the next section called um, In Sickness, In Death. Uh, this is one of the first poems I ever, ever wrote and ever got published, actually. Um, it's called Ebola Virus. It moves on. Why does it ho its host always expire? It wonders, is it me or is it them? First day of summer, low tide beneath the blinding sunlight. In a watery alcove by the shore, she finds a chest of treasure in the bones of the man she lost. Okay. Um, I think you all know I'm a big fan of the apocalypse. So we have this huge section at the end um, about the end. 
Um, so yes, there's a lot of ends. So rare peaceful day, he removes his earphones outside. Half of earth has been blasted away. And my very favorite poem in this whole collection, Asteroid. Seconds before the asteroid hits, he finally tells me he loves me. I roll. Um, this is one really fun one um, about aliens and how we might actually interact with them when they finally come here. And you know they will one day, right? <laughs> All are welcome. Everyone was mostly polite through their clicking sounds and pincer-like arms. But we drew a line when the alien couple decided to have our brains for lunch. Their banishment began an interplanetary conflict that turned Mars red and ended the first age of man. Um, I've always been fascinated with all the... Um, the new Earth planets, uh, you know, the, the, the Keplers and all, all the ones that are Earth-like, you know, and, and sometimes I, I, I dream of going there one day and, you know, living there, but, you know, there are a lot of practical considerations like, can we breathe, can we eat, you know, um, is their bacteria going to kill us, is our bacteria going to kill them, and make the planet completely hospitable, so, you know, it's, it's very you know, significant, I think, for, for us speculative poets to examine questions like this. Uh, and one of them is life on Kepler-452b, one of our best candidates now. I could not help bringing home a flower from Kepler-452b. No one ever imagined Earth's extinction would be by Poland. And um, another one that's written by the child in me, um, examining the questions we have when, when we do uh, have the choice to travel to another planet one day. All that we love. I wake up from hibernation on a new planet, mourning my lovey who didn't survive the thousand years. And of course, when we get there, what's going to happen? The many ways we die in space. Too quickly, he leapt joyfully into the alien sea. We needed no readings to realize it was acid. First night on our new planet, the death mist takes us. Fifth element of Kepler B. Within sight, before our engines died, Proxima Century. Okay, and when we get there, how are we gonna do? Alien worlds. Ruby Sky, first day as an alien. Just wanting to see blue skies again. Arturus orbit, seeing red all day, Antares orbit. Um, for us, used to seeing, um, you know, blue skies and everything, I think a red sun would, you know, be kind of depressing. So we would have to change our biology, I think, if you do go there. So, um, yeah, so what, what's going to happen when we bring our cats there? <laughs> I think that's what all of us cat lovers want to know. Cats in space! A world of possibilities. My cat in the box. 
still can't decide whether to go in or out. Our cat hovers by the entrance of our escape pod. <laughs> Watching the last space shuttle leave, our feet gently kneading the blue grass, me and my cat. This goes out to all the people who need to move to another country but can't bring their elderly pet along, um, but decide to see. So, um, okay, um, as you can tell, this was supposed to be end, but there's a lot of ends. So I, I always believe the end's not really the end. Um, just keeping an eye on the clock and seeing how many pages I got. Okay, we're, we're almost at the end. Um, okay, the rest are kind of depressing, so I'm going to move <laughs> to the fun ones. Uh, all right, so what would aliens do to us when we meet them? That's always something fun to imagine. Ah, uh, aliens. Still biting me. The moth-sized mosquitoes on Mars. I think as tropical people suffer this the most and we're petrified of anything larger than the, the mosquitoes we have now. Age-old battle in the skies of Jupiter, cloud leviathans. During the long years, far from the sun, I sleep, dormant from the cold, life form on planet X. It's coming around, Planet X. Uh, immortality. Just one drop of blood from the alien. Okay. And, and one very pertinent question, uh, which is under Mysteries of Space. I'll, I'll save the rest for you to ponder. But this one is very pertinent. Seemingly emerging seemingly unharmed from a wormhole. Part of me wonders, am I still me? They, they actually opened one mini wormhole somewhere in the world, um, physicists, so that'd be fun. And uh, a little scary one. Uh, and beyond, this is the beyond section. Slow boat to the stars. The humans we began with, not the same humans who arrive. Uh, and that can be interpreted in the Twilight Zone way or literally. So that's pretty fun. Um, okay, and this is another fun, humorous one. Found footage. There goes our last wrench tumbling into space, and now our engineer with it. That was how our space arc failed, and how humans became extinct. Not, not funny. Um, and finally, I'd like to close with a closing poem, because I always like to bring things full circle. Um, we come back to gravity, of course. Greg Ian. An eternal divide between sea and sky, the gravity of existence. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> uh, it's so nice to get to hear you read your poems. Um, I think Lee was saying in the chat that it's like a surprise all over again. And I really agree with that. Cause like, there's parts that I'm like, oh yeah. Like, I don't know. I think these poems really lend themselves to reading over and over again. So yeah, <laughs> um, I wanna open up our Q and A section. So if anyone has questions, feel free to either, you know, pop your camera on if you want. Um, although just to know we are recording and it's live. So if you don't wanna be seen, I understand. Um, but where you can put your question in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna start off, we have been working on this essay uh, with you about um, sci-fi haiku, 
sci-fi coup, haiku and speculative, you know, that kind of stuff. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, just like what haiku is to you, because I think um, there's different interpretations and I want to know how you came to that form. Um, yes, I actually began writing um, sci-fi coup for uh, sci-fi quest and um, uh, Terry, the uh, editor, actually guided me a lot um, through my journey, so I'm very grateful to her. Um, initially, when I first um, when I first started writing, I didn't realize that it wasn't just syllable counting. Um, I had a really good time syllable counting, though. That that said, you know, um, my kids would see me, "Mom, what are you doing with your fingers?" You know, and I'm. Counting, counting, counting. Okay, sounds good. All right, we've got a poem there. Um, and uh, and then um, one day, um, I think it was either Terry or one of my haiku friends kind of told me, you know, we, we kind of write differently. It's not just counting. Um, that's ex actually a, a juxtaposition um, of two images that tell a story. Um, and I was like, whoa, that sounds even cooler, you know, it's, um, and, um, and then when I went through the steps of actually learning how to write uh, haiku, um, guided by, by many kind people from the Haiku Foundation and um, uh, haiku magazines that I, I sent my work to, um, I thought, um, this is like an incredible math puzzle that's, um, that's something to unravel. So initially when I was um, counting syllables, it was a matter of fitting the story within the 17 syllables. Uh, and that was really fun. Um, you know, like I said, it felt very smart, you know. So, yeah. um, but uh, then when it came to creating two images that juxtapose or complemented each other, uh, to tell a full story within like three lines. And I think in some cases, you know, we, we write it in one line as well. Oh, yeah, I didn't write, I didn't read any of the uh, one line haiku. Um, um, it was such an incredible challenge I felt. And um, to create layers in between them um, so that they could be read both ways um, uh, was something really fun and it became more of a construction thing for me rather than just uh you know just a regular poem because with my regular poems I I, I just write you know it's um then I, I edit them for brevity and everything but this this was like a real exercise in being super brief you know and um and the, the I think the principle is the less words you use, uh, the better uh, the haiku is. Um, in a sense, of course, you know, you use the words you need to use, but you know, you, you take out the extraneous words and retain the meaning. So I actually did um, under under philosophy, I did logic uh, when I was in my first year in university. I loved it. It was so fun. It's like you you take these logic puzzles and you you cut them down you know, and make the arguments make sense. And, you know, for me, haiku is like that. And to add a speculative element to it was just expanded, you know, the possibilities. And I just thought it was so incredible because you can actually use words like event horizon as, as uh, you know, as, as a seasonal word. You know, we, we in, in traditional haiku, um, Japanese haiku, you use a seasonal word to sort of like indicate time and place. Um, so when you read it, you know where you are in time and place. So, uh, you know, I'm like, whoa, we can use, we can use like haunted house and we can use, uh, you know, um, Medusa's lair or something like that. And, you know, it just makes everything so exciting and fun. And, you know, ever since I've, I've written so many, um, sci-fi coup and you know expanding on it tanker as well there's some uh side tankers kind of like haiku but in five lines so you have a bit more space to tell a story 
Um, and it was just so fun and so incredible. And I could write it literally on the go on my phone while, you know, waiting for a kid to finish class. Um, I mean, this, this all started when I was, you know, taking my kids around and stuff. And uh, ju just before I went to sleep, you know, I, you know, try to be in the moment and think of something that happened today. So I think the whole experience um, of writing sci-fi ku and, and haiku um, is, it's a matter of um, being being in the moment, I guess, being being present. Yeah, I mean, it can be you can write in any genre, but it's just capturing that moment, whether it's in your imagination or it's something that actually happened. Um, so I think that that's the beauty of the language, you know, to to have in in general three lines that can tell a story if you want to manipulate it to oh that's a terrible word isn't it if you want to adjust it so that you um you can read it both ways um that's even so much more and, and there's so many layers inside that tiny poem that that makes it so exciting so that everyone reads it differently and you know even the same person can read it differently you know in, in in more than one way and i think that's that's what i love about it that it's like a it's like a puzzle box that you can you can you know unravel in many different ways and i hope i answered the question because i've gone on a tangent that's again okay. I? I wanted the tangent <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. that's so uh great and i love the idea of the speculative element being the um seasonal kind of word like that's that's such an interesting idea and I hadn't thought about it like that but I really love that um so Lee wants to know if you're writing another cat themed collection <laughs> at some point <laughs> I I definitely have enough um I actually hand cut and hand produced my first mini mini book but I don't think I have the uh, stamina for that anymore so <laughs> I might put one together and submit when there's another open call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love speculative cat poems and um, there's a lot of interest, I think, in that lately. So um, yeah. Amelia, let's see what is. Amelia says, I really enjoyed when you talked about the structure of the book. How did you approach poems that were especially hard to classify, especially if they fit into in too many sections? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I, I was talking about this in general about horror the other day. And um, I always think of classification as a method to sell books. Um, and I'm, I'm all for crossing genres and, you know, making stuff unclassifiable, but that will make it really hard for our publishers. So, you know, um, we try to, um, we try to fit them where they most fit, I guess. Does that make sense? Um, like with a lot of my, when I was, when I was putting this book together, I realized that um, a lot of the stuff I wrote had a horror slant. Um, even the the space ones, like you know, they, they kind of die in the end, so that's horror, right? You know, um, and you know, like poor guy jumping into the acid sea. You know, you can argue that's horror as well. So, um, you know, if you want to talk about science fiction, that's what happens as well. You know, I mean, we've we've not we've not conquered that and and gotten our science good enough for us to actually go out there. You know, that's that's probably what's going to happen. If you read hard science fiction, that's that's what they say and they do. Um, so in terms of classification, like I would I would argue that I argue that most of my poems in here are horror because horror is it's in, in our lives, it's every day, you know, like, like I, like I said, um, you know, every, everything can be classified as horror. Someone dying can be horror. It's horror to you. Grief is horror. Domestic violence is horror. You know, all the crime we see, that's, that's, that's real life horror. So, you know, um, I was talking about monsters before. That's definitely horror. Um, but you could also similarly argue this collection is, is really science fiction. There's such a huge element of it. Um, and there's a lot of science in it as well, you know, the section about zapping our brains and stuff like that, that's that science, you know, 
you know, it doesn't always turn out the way you want it to, but, you know, um, but I guess um, you choose a majority, you choose a market and, you know, you, you pick the ones that would, would fit, even if arguably. Um, for me, I, I always let the, the, the collection guide me. Um, how I put my poems together is I have one word file um, and I put all the poems that I like that are published or uh, not published inside. And then when I feel that I have enough brain space to sit down and put it together or, oh, there's an open call, I better start getting it together. Um, and then I, I spend quite a bit of time arranging the poems so that it forms a kind of narrative. Um, as you can tell from this book, I like to, I do like to classify things very much, um, bad habit, but, um, uh, and I totally lost my point there. Um, but yeah, so basically, yes, you can kind of edge it to where you think or where you can argue um, that it can be classified under, basically. I mean, I, I would... I could write an essay about how Sylvia Plath's poems are horror, um, but that will take a while. So oh, please send me that, that essay. <laughs> I want to read that. I am obsessed. I'm obsessed. Uh, I I uh, was doing like a poem series where I would take. Oh, it was it was like kind of an experiment where you take um, someone's poem and you switch every word to the opposite meaning of that word in oh, the poem. That's, that sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah, and I was doing this like with Sylvia Plath's poems to like kind of, and then I would like make it my own poem and inspired by it. Um, so yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, huh. Lee also said, I loved your essay in writing poems in the dark, which is um, a book that is out now from- um, Thank you, Lee. Yeah, uh, Stephanie Whitevich right? Is the, yes. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. So talk Anthology. about that essay because I haven't read the whole book yet and I don't think I got to it. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's basically, um, uh, well, it's called the art of speculative haiku and it's a much expanded version with, um, step-by-step -step examples of, um, of how, you know, how one would appreciate and read a speculative poem. Uh, and also how to write one. So I uh, actually have a little, you know, a uh, little uh, thing you can print out and, uh, you know, practice later oh, at cool. the end. Because I thought that would be of value. I mean, you read about yeah. how to's and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, okay, how am I going to try this now? So um, I did create a step-by-step -step because I thought that, um, I mean, it's a craft anthology. So, you know, apart from just saying, okay, this is what it is, uh, this is how you read it, how, this is how you write it, um, so now you're going to write it, you know, um, so that I, I hope will give, you know, lots of value to the readers and also, um, yeah, and I, I kind of shared my thought process through writing a, uh, um, a sample poem, um, about a purple octopus that eventually didn't become purple because it didn't suit the poem. So <laughs> it, it's kind of weird, but I thought that it would bring some humor to the exercise rather than, you know, a kind of stayed example. Um, so that's a much expanded version. Um, the essay that I, I wrote for um, the magazine is uh, more bare bones, but it gets to the heart of it so that someone who, who reads the article would um, know instantly what they're looking for. And, you know, those three lines are just gibberish. <laughs> you know, there's, there's much deeper meaning in it. And, you know, once you, it, it's kind of like the matrix, you know, once you, once you take the, um, the right pill, which one it is, but once you take the right pill, you know, you will just see and you can't unsee it. So, um, yeah. Yes, next awesome. October, Amelia. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> earlier. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so one more question. I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, and so this is like a question I try, I like ask a lot of writers, but I was wondering how you approach writing about 
sort of personal or difficult topics because I think there's a lot of personal in your writing and your poems. Um, and it's it always impresses me how you manage to get that into such a small space. So I was wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I actually try to obscure a lot of personal stuff. <laughs> Uh, in the words of the um, famous tanker writer, uh, Alexis Rotella, she says, you know, you you don't know if that's fact or you don't know if that's fiction, but that's my writing, so you, you got to untangle it. So I think fiction gives us a, um, and poetry, uh, gives us a way to write stuff with plausible deniability. <laughs> Behind the veil. Um, but, you know, I mean, as writers, we get our sources from everywhere and um, we do write. I do write, you know, quite a bit of personal stuff and a lot of personal thoughts and, you know, personal dreams as well. And uh, so I, I guess when you write from third person, it's kind of easy to obscure that it's about yourself, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and generally it's about stuff that can happen to anyone. And, you know, um, so uh, I, I do hesitate about writing too many personal things because I'm, I'm generally a very private person. Um, and um, I guess, yeah, that, that's, that's, how, that's how I kind of write it. Um, those super personal ones will probably not be published till some decades later, but you know, it's still there. So, um, you know, I, I will, will probably be edited quite a bit by then as well. I, I find that every five years I look at my work and, oh God, I got to edit that. Um, so yeah, um, that person sometimes, um, I guess not, not being too specific about things uh, that I write about because uh, you know how books and movies they have that this this uh, does not resemble any person right. fictional or alive something 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 aka don't sue us yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess for for us poets we kind of hide behind um, you know, vagueness and the fact that, you know, this can happen to anyone. And um, I guess at some point I will, you know, write a bit more overtly, but I'm not sure when that'll be, but maybe one day. I think I think um, reading a lot of um, Plath and Sexton has, you know, opened up my eyes quite a bit and also about, you know, how transparent they could be about their lives especially during that time you know which is pretty incredible mm -hmm. and I read a lot of amazing contemporary poets now who you know um write about their lives I guess growing up in an Asian country we, we tend to be a bit more reticent you know you you don't you don't talk about that stuff outside the family mm, yeah. and we're like okay I shall not so um <laughs> it's kind of a thing you know and it's still quite ingrained um, and I really admire people who can come out of that. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess that means that I have quite a bit of work still to do. And, um, and uh, it's always, it is always very interesting and exciting to read about people who, who have the courage to talk about their lives and their poetry. Well, it strikes me that, do you think the speculative can be sort of a metaphor for that? Oh, yes, definitely. Like definitely. the monster and the, you know, these tropes, we, we use them sort of as metaphors for the personal. I so. think we do. Um, I think um, the Pontiana, uh, it's a Southeast Asian um, monster, has been a trope for a lot of um, women living in Asia. Sorry, my hair is driving me nuts. Uh, it's kind of uh, yeah, it's been a trope, and um, she has kind of morphed over the years in in um, in books and in movies to have more um, 
to have more agency and more power. And I think that when poets like me write about her empowered and other writers as well, you know, we, we have changed the cultural landscape of how we think at the, at the very least subversively, you know, um, mm. but our roles in society. So um, that has definitely changed. And I think definitely a lot of um, speculative writers who use these tropes could very well be telling stories of what they know, um, but, you know, can't quite tell their stories yeah. yet, yeah. you know, for safety reasons or, um, so it's, it's something interesting to unravel, you know, maybe 50 years from now when their bio is out and you're like, oh, okay, so that's what happened, <laughs> you know, and yeah. that makes perfect sense. And I think that's what fascinates people about uh, Sylvia Plath and, and Sexton is that their personal lives are there for us to, you know, kind of look through and realize, oh, so she was referring to that and that makes perfect sense, you know, but if you read the poem, uh, as a standalone, um, you know, if you read Daddy as a standalone, you wouldn't imagine, you know, there wouldn't be as much context to what it meant, as well as Lazy, Lady Lazarus. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we don't have, thankfully, enough um, so-called uh, information about all our writers to create such uh, a comparison but um definitely it creates new layers you know in terms of how you would read a poem if you knew something about that writer's life does that answer the question yeah i will no i like the reference to sylvia plath and Anne sexton because for me there's sort of like this trio i would add um like virginia wolf to that kind of trio of these you know women who have written very honestly and in times when they weren't um sort of it wasn't socially acceptable mm -hmm. and now we look back and sort of pick apart their lives trying to understand you know um that and so that's a great I would have listed those as examples also so <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So that is all of our questions for this session. And um, again, thank you everyone for coming and for supporting Interstellar Flight Press um, and our speculative poets. And thank you, Christina, for your lovely, lovely book and for chatting with us. And, um, you know, everyone look out for this essay that Christina will be publishing in, in our magazine. It'll probably be out Friday is my goal. Um, and if you don't have a copy of The Gravity of Existence, um, go buy it. It is officially out today on all the places where you want to buy books online. Um, and then, you know, we do um, hit up uh, cons <laughs> in the U.S. when we can. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll be at some cons next year. But, you know, I, it's so lovely getting to chat with you, Christina. Really appreciate thank you it. So much. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, keep writing. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here today and celebrating with us.